a Wikividi Documentaries production. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Enjoy. Emiliano Zapata Emiliano Zapata Salazar was a leading figure in the Mexican Revolution, the main leader of the Peasant Revolution in the state of Morelos, and the inspiration of the agrarian movement called Zapatismo. Zapata was born in the rural village of Aninaculco in Morelos state, where peasant communities were under increasing pressure from the small landowning class who monopolized land and water resources for sugarcane production with the support of dictator Porfirio Diaz. Zapata early on participated in political movements against Diaz and the landowning Hacendados, and when the revolution broke out in 1910 he was positioned as a central leader of the peasant revolt in Morelos. Cooperating with a number of other peasant leaders he formed the Liberation Army of the South of which he soon became the undisputed leader. Zapata's forces contributed to the fall of Diaz, defeating the Federal Army in the Battle of Cuautla. But when the revolutionary leader Francisco I. Madero became president he disavowed the role of the Zapatistas, denouncing them as simple bandits. In November 1911, Zapata promulgated the Plan de Ajala which called for substantial land reforms, redistributing lands to the peasants. Madero sent the Federal Army to root out the Zapatistas in Morelos. Madero's generals employed a scorched earth policy, burning villages and forcibly removing their inhabitants and drafting many men into the army or sending them to forced labor camps in southern Mexico. This strengthened Zapata's standing among the peasants, and Zapata was able to drive the forces of Madero led by Victoriano Horta out of Morelos. In a coup against Madero in February 1913, Horta took power in Mexico, but a coalition of constitutionalist forces in northern Mexico led by Venustiano Carranza, Alvaro Obregón, and Francisco Villaos did him in July 1914 with the support of Zapata's troops. Zapata did not recognize the authority that Carranza asserted as leader of the revolutionary movement, continuing his adherence to the Plan de Ajala. In the aftermath of the revolutionaries' victory over Huerta, they attempted to sort out power relations in the Convention of Ascalientes. Zapata and Villa broke with Carranza, and Mexico descended into civil war among the winners. Dismayed with the alliance with Villa, Zapata focused his energies on rebuilding society in Morelos which he now controlled, instituting the land reforms of the Plan de Ajala. As Carranza consolidated his power and defeated Villa in 1915, Zapata initiated guerrilla warfare against the Caran sisters, who in turn invaded Morelos, employing once again scorched earth tactics to oust the Zapatista rebels. Zapata once again retook Morelos in 1917, and held most of the state against Carranza's troops until he was killed in an ambush in April 1919. After his death as Zapatista generals aligned with Obregón against Carranza and helped drive Carranza from power. In 1920, Zapatistas managed to obtain powerful posts in the governance of Morelos after Carranza's fall. They instituted many of the land reforms envisioned by Zapata in Morelos. Zapata remains an iconic figure in Mexico, used both as a nationalist symbol as well as a symbol of the Neo-Zapatista movement. Early Years Before the Revolution Emiliano Zapata was born to Gabriel Zapata and Cleofas Gertrudes Salazar Avenina Chuilco, Morelos, a well-known local family. Emiliano's godfather was the manager of a large local hacienda, and his godmother, the manager's wife. Zapata's family were Mexicans of Noa and Spanish ancestry, that is Mestizos. Emiliano was the ninth of ten children. His older brother Eufemio Zapata is also a figure in Morelos history. From a family of farmers, Emiliano Zapata had insight into the severe difficulties of the countryside and his village's long struggle to regain the land taken by expanding haciendas. He received a limited education from his teacher, Emilio Vara but it included the rudiments of bookkeeping. At the age of 16 or 17, Zapata had to care for his family following his father's death. Emiliano was entrepreneurial, buying a team of mules to haul maize from farms to town, as well as bricks to the hacienda of China Mica. He was also a successful farmer, growing watermelons as a cash crop. He was a skilled horseman and competed in rodeos and races, as well as bullfighting from horseback. These skills as a horseman brought him work as a horse trainer for Porfirio Diaz's son-in-law, who had a hacienda nearby, and served Zapata well as a revolutionary leader. 
He had a striking appearance, with a large moustache in which he took pride. And good quality clothing described by a comrade, General Zapata's dress until his death was a charo outfit, tight-fitting black cashmere pants with silver buttons, a broad charo hat, a fine linen shirt or jacket, a scarf around his neck, boots of a single piece, Amazokana style spurs, and a pistol at his belt. In an undated studio photo, Zapata is dressed in a standard business suit and tie, projecting an image of a man of means. Around the turn of the 20th century, Anina Chualco was mixed Spanish-speaking mestizo, an indigenous Nahual-speaking Pueblo. It had a long history of protesting the local haciendas taking community members' land, and its leaders gathered colonial-era documentation of their land titles to prove their claims. Some of the colonial documentation was in Nahual, with contemporary translations to Spanish for use in legal cases in the Spanish courts. One eyewitness account by Luz Jimenez of Milpurdla states that Emiliano Zapata spoke Nahual fluently when his forces arrived in her community. After Porfirio Diaz came to the presidency of Mexico by a coup in 1876, the Mexican social and economic system was dominated by larger states controlling much of the land and squeezing the holdings of independent communities. Many peasants were subsequently forced into debt peonage on the haciendas. Diaz ran local elections to give the semblance of democracy. However, his close confidants and associates were given offices in districts throughout Mexico. These officials became enforcers of changes in land tenure that favored the concentration of land progressively into the hands of fewer and wealthier landowners. Community members in Anina Cuilco, including Zapata, sought redress against land seizures. In 1892, a delegation had an audience with Diaz, who with the intervention of a lawyer, agreed to hear them. Although promising them to deal favorably with their petition, Diaz had them arrested and Zapata was conscripted into the Federal Army. Under Diaz, conscription into the Federal Army was much feared by ordinary Mexican men and their families. Zapata was one of many rebel leaders who was conscripted at some point. In 1909, an important meeting was called by the elders of Anina Cuilco whose chief elder was Jose Marino. He announced, My intention to resign from my position due to my old age and limited abilities to continue the fight for the land rights of the village. The meeting was used as a time for discussion and nomination of individuals as a replacement for Marino as the president of the village council. The elders on the council were so well respected by the village men that no one would dare to override their nominations or vote for an individual against the advice of the current council. At that time, the nominations made were Modesto Gonzalez, Bartolo Parol, and Emiliano Zapata. After the nominations were closed, a vote was taken, and Zapata became the new council president without contest. Although Zapata had turned 30 only a month before, voters knew that it was necessary to elect someone respected by the community who would be responsible for the village. Even though he was relatively young, Anina Cuilco was ready to hand over the leadership to him without any worry of failure. Before he was elected he had shown the village his nature by helping to head up a campaign in opposition to the candidate Diaz had chosen governor. Even though Zapata's efforts failed, he was able to create and cultivate relationships with political authority figures that would prove useful for him. Zapata became a leading figure in the village of Anina Cuilco where his family had lived for many generations, and he became involved in struggles for the rights of the campesinas of Morelos. He was able to oversee the redistribution of the land from some haciendas peacefully, but had problems with others. He observed numerous conflicts between villagers and hacendados, or landowners, over the constant theft of village land, and in one instance, saw the hacendados torch an entire villa. For many years, he campaigned steadfastly for the rights of the villagers, first establishing via ancient title deeds their claims to disputed land, and then pressing the recalcitrant governor of Morelos into action. Finally, disgusted with the slow response from the government and the overt bias towards the wealthy plantation owners, Zapata began making use of armed force, simply taking over the land in dispute. The 1910 Revolution the flawed 1910 elections were a major reason for the outbreak of the Mexican Revolution in 1910. Porfirio Diaz was being threatened by the candidacy of Francisco I. Madero. 
Zapata, seeing an opportunity to promote land reform in Mexico, made quiet alliances with Madero, whom he perceived to be the best chance for genuine change in the country. Although he was wary about Madero, Zapata cooperated with him. When Madero made vague promises about land reform in his plan of San Luis Potosí, land reform was the central feature of Zapata's political vision. Zapata joined Madero's campaign against President Diaz, while Zapata's army captured Cuautla after a six-day battle on May 19, 1911. It became clear that Diaz would not hold on to power for long. With the support of Pancho Villa, Pascual Orozco, Emiliano Zapata, and rebellious peasants, Madero overthrew Diaz in May 1911 at the Battle of Ciudad Juarez. A provisional government was formed under Francisco León de la Barra. Under Madero, some new land reforms were carried out and elections were to be ensured. However, Zapata was dissatisfied with Madero's stance on land reform, which Madero did not really believe in, and was unable Despite repeated efforts, to make him understand the importance of the issue or to get him to act on it. Revolutionary General Madero was not ready to create a radical change in the manner that agrarian relations operated during this time. Some other individuals, called anarcho-syndicalist agitators, had made promises to take things back to the way that they had been done previously. The major method of agrarian relations had been that of communal lands, called ejidos. Although some believed that this could be the best course of action, Madero simply demanded that public servants act morally in enforcing the law. Upon seeing the response by villagers, Madero offered formal justice in courts to individuals who had been wronged by others with regard to agrarian politics. Zapata decided that on the surface it seemed as though Madero was doing good things for the people of Mexico, but Zapata did not know the level of sincerity in Madero's actions and thus did not know if he should support him completely. Madero and Zapata's relations worsened during the summer of 1911 as Madero appointed a governor who supported plantation owners and refused to meet Zapata's agrarian demands. Compromises between the two failed in November 1911, days after Madero was elected president. Zapata and Otilio Montano Sanchez, a former school teacher, fled to the mountains of southwest Puebla. There they formed the most radical reform plan in Mexico, the Plan de Ajala. The plan declared Madero a traitor, named Pascual Orozco head of the revolution, and outlined a plan for true land reform. The plan of Ajala called for all lands stolen under Diaz, to be immediately returned. There was considerable land fraud under the old dictator, so a great deal of territory was involved. It also stated that large plantations owned by a single person or family should have one third of their land nationalized and would then be required to give it to poor farmers. It also argued that if any large plantation owner resisted this action, they should have the other two thirds confiscated as well. The plan of Ajala also invoked the name of Benito Juarez, one of Mexico's great leaders, and compared the taking of land from the wealthy to Juarez's actions when he took land from the church in the 1860s. Zapata was partly influenced by an anarchist from Oaxaca named Ricardo Flores Magón. The influence of Flores Magón on Zapata can be seen in the Zapatistas' plan de Ajala, but even more noticeably in their slogan, Tierra y Libertad, or Land and Liberty, the title and maxim of Flores Magan's most famous work. Zapata's introduction to anarchism came via Montano Sanchez later a general in Zapata's army, executed on May 17, 1917 who exposed Zapata to the works of Peter Kropotkin and Flores Magan at the same time as Zapata was observing and beginning to participate in the struggles of the peasants for the land. The plan proclaimed the Zapatista demands for reformer, libertad, ley y justicia. Zapata also declared the Maderistas as a counter-revolution and denounced Madero. Zapata mobilized his liberation army and allied with former Maderistas Pascual Orozco and Emiliano Vosquez Gomez. Orozco was from Chihuahua, near the U.S. border, and thus was able to aid the Zapatistas with a supply of arms. In the following weeks, the development of military operations betray good evidence of clear and intelligent planning. During Orozco's rebellion, Zapata fought Mexican troops in the south near Mexico City, in the original design of the armed force. Zapata was a mere colonel among several others. However, 
The true plan that came about through this organization lent itself to Zapata. Zapata believed that the best route of attack would be to center the fighting and action in Cuautla. If this political location could be overthrown, the army would have enough power to veto anyone else's control of the state, negotiate for Cuernavaca or attack it directly, and maintain independent access to Mexico City as well as escape routes to the southern hills. However, in order to gain this great success, Zapata realized that his men needed to be better armed and trained. The first line of action demanded that Zapata and his men control the area behind and below a line from Jojutla to Yekapixtla. When this was accomplished it gave the army the ability to complete trades as well as wait. As the opposition of the federal army and police detachments slowly dissipated, the army would be able to eventually gain powerful control over key locations in the Interoceanic Railway, from Puebla City to Cuautla. If these feats could be completed, it would gain access to Cuautla directly and the city would fall. The plan of action was carried out successfully in Jojutla. However, Pablo Torres Burgos, the commander of the operation, was disappointed that the army disobeyed his orders against looting and ransacking. The army took complete control of the area, and it seemed as though Torres Burgos lost any type of control that he believed he had over his forces prior to this event. Shortly after, Burgos called a meeting and resigned from his position. Upon leaving Joe Jutler with his two sons, Burgos was surprised by a federal police patrol who subsequently shot all three of the men on the spot. This seemed to some to be an ending blow to the movement, because Burgos had not selected a successor for his position. However, Zapata was ready to take up where Burgos had left off. Shortly after Burgos' death, a party of rebels elected Zapata as Supreme Chief of the Revolutionary Movement of the South. This seemed to be the fix to all of the problems that had just arisen, but other individuals wanted to replace Zapata as well. Due to this new conflict, the individual who would come out on top would have to do so by convincing his peers he deserved their backing. Zapata finally did gain the support necessary by his peers and was considered a singularly qualified candidate. This decision to make Zapata the true leader of the revolution did not occur all at once, nor did it ever reach a true definitive level of recognition. In order to succeed, Zapata needed a strong financial backing for the battles to come. This came in the form of 10,000 pesos delivered by Rodolfo from the Tacubians. Due to this amazing sum of money Zapata's group of rebels became one of the strongest in the state financially. After some time Zapata became the leader of his strategic zone. This gave him tremendous power and control over the actions of many more individual rebel groups and thus increased his margin of success greatly among revolutionaries in other districts of the state. However, Zapata's authority was more tenuous. After a meeting with Zapata and Ambrosio Fueroa in Jolalpan, it was decided that Zapata would have joint power with Fueroa with regard to operations in Morelos. This was a turning point in the level of authority and influence that Zapata had gained and proved useful in the direct overthrow of Morelos. Zapata immediately began to use his newly found power and began to overthrow city after city with gaining momentum. Madero, alarmed, asked Zapata to disarm and demobilize. Zapata responded that, if the people could not win their rights now, when they were armed, they would have no chance once they were unarmed and helpless. Madero sent several generals in an attempt to deal with Zapata, but these efforts had little success. It seemed as though Zapata would shortly be able to overthrow Madero. Before he could overthrow Madero, General Victoriano Horta beat him to it in February 1913, ordering Madero arrested and executed. This officially and formally ended the civil war, although this may have caused individuals to believe that the revolution was over, it was not. The battle continued for years to come, over the fact that Mexican individuals did not have agrarian rights that were fair, nor did they have the protection necessary to fight against those who pushed such exploitation upon them. If there was anyone that Zapata hated more than Diaz in Madero, it was Victoriano Huerta, the bitter, violent alcoholic who had been responsible for many atrocities in southern Mexico while trying to end the rebellion. Zapata was not alone. In the north, Pancho Villa, who had supported Madero, immediately took to the field against Huerta. Zapata revised the plan of Ajala and named himself the leader of his revolution. He was joined by two newcomers to the revolution, 
Venus Tiano Carranza and Alvaro Obregón, who raised large armies in Coahuila and Sonora respectively. Together they made short work of Huerta, who resigned and fled in June 1914 after repeated military losses to the Big Four. Brought to you by Wikividi Documentaries Would you like to know more?